You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Steeter. It's Wednesday, June 26th, 2019. I'm Michael Brooks, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Murtaza Hussein, reporter for The Intercept. We're talking about an Iranian activist who wrote dozens of articles for right-wing outlets. Here's the secret. Turns out it wasn't a real person. It was a multitude of bots that were run by a group called the MEK, a group that has paid political figures from John Bolton to Howard Dean to help instigate an invasion of Iran. We'll connect that with the stakes of the current situation with Iran that the Trump administration has instigated over the past couple of years. Iran says that the door to diplomacy is closed permanently. Also, Jared Kushner he finally had his bar mitzvah. No, oh, excuse me. He unveiled his solution to the crisis in the Middle East. And it's basically bribe a handful of Palestinians and tell the rest of them to, uh, in the words of a New York Times editorial recently, commit a national suicide. Of course, nothing wrong with that, according to contrarian views. Of course, this plan, not well received by the human beings of Palestine and Queens. We, it looks like we have a great new DSA district attorney. If you're a landlord, slumlord, or an employer, or an ICE official, be worried. Hell yeah. Excellent news with Tiffany Caban. Terrible news in Brazil, where the politically driven Supreme Court have rejected a habeas corpus bid by political prisoner Lula da Silva. We'll get into that. Oregon climate bill is dead, Senate Democrats say, after Republicans went to some pretty extreme measures to kill it. We'll talk about that. Robert Mueller is set to testify to Congress. Drama. Bernie Sanders is using his massive email list to warn immigrants about ICE raids along with get funding to abortion clinics. Wayfair employees plan walk a plan a walkout to oppose furniture sales to migrant detention facilities. An appeals court says the census case is not over, even if the Supreme Court upholds the citizenship question. And repeated mistakes in a phone record collection program led the NSA to shut down the controversial program. Nice to know that there was a lot of mistakes there. Congressman Duncan Hunter used campaign funds to pursue affairs and was literally in bed with lobbyists. You know that the Politico guy that got to write that piece was super stoked. Democrats' monument lawsuit against Donald Trump can proceed if federal Trump, the federal judge rules. President South Korean President Moon says that a new U.S.-North Korea summit possibly in the works and the NRA has killed off and the NRA has taken aim and fired at NRA TV too bad actually we didn't even use them for clips anymore that's how irrelevant they were yeah, but maybe they will give us a couple days of Vic Berger material so that'll be fun maybe Sam will get some uh, video equipment on the cheap that was Sam's very <laughs> very on brand move to I, tweet out that he would like some uh, video that there was some type of fire sale I can't believe Grant Stinchfield 1776 wasn't enough of a talent to build a television network <laughs> around which one was Grant? Uh, Stenchfield. Uh, oh yeah, okay. Brendan says shots fired. Brendan with the off camera. Oh clips. damn! Or shots not fired. Huh? <laughs> uh, and yeah. uh, and uh, cereal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Trigger locks put in place. Trigger warning. <laughs>
Ugh, wow. There's also a McCain brunch angle to that story. Very excited. The best thing that came out of NRA TV was definitely the Megan McCain brunch angle. But let's start in a in a in a on a hopeful note in a great way. It as of now, Tiffany Caban has an over one percent lead over the machine candidate Melinda Katz, who was endorsed by uh, hack and blowhard Joe Crowley, uh, who of course lost his seat to AOC and uh, fuses together. Uh, Wall Street machine politics. Uh, So if it stays over 1%, there will not be a recount, and Tiffany Caban will win this race. This is hugely significant. Obviously, first and foremost, for the people of Queens, where all of a sudden you'll have a public defender, someone who actually cares about justice and humanity in a prosecutorial position. Look at some of the really significant things Krasner's done. Remember the photos of the cleaning shop in Philadelphia? I'm stoked to see those same... uh, feeds coming out of Queens, but also nationally. I mean, when people like Bernie Sanders put together serious packages on criminal justice reform, they're going to need DAs to cooperate and implement this stuff across the country. DAs races are absolutely some of the most important parts of electoral politics. And Tiffany Caban immediately becomes a vital national leader here. Here he is. Here she is, excuse me, at her victory last night in Queens. simply because they cannot afford their bail. While the wealthy continue to be able to buy their constitutional right to the presumption of innocence. We cannot continue to criminalize mental health issues. Substance use disorder. Excellent. So this is an incredible breakthrough, uh, you know, between her and Krasner and other candidates across the country. This is huge. I mean, this is going to be the actual material breakup of the vicious prison and punitive uh, sentencing policies and prosecutorial policies that have dominated this country for decades. Um And it's also an opportunity, on the other hand, while you claw back and reverse those things to actually really reinvent what this job actually is. Maybe this job is about going up against landlords. Maybe this job is about going up against uh, companies and employers and other people that actually cause harm in communities. Uh, Huge amount of potential here. Huge victory. Awesome for uh, Tiffany Caban and for Queens and Actually, for all of us, there's definitely national implications from her win. Hell yeah. And I just want to note the woman standing next to her up there is Bianca Cunningham, the co-chair of New York City DSA, which played a major role in canvassing for Caban, endorsing her very early. And I was really excited that we got to be a part of it in North Brooklyn. We're very close to Ridgewood, Queens, and we sent a lot of people to canvas. Awesome. We were a superpower. We are now a hyperpowered. Oh my God! How did you did you leak notes from the uh, recordings from the DSA board meeting? 
Whoops. Wouldn't that be awesome if North Brooklyn DSA, like when they, when people were out, like they're all they're like tatted and earnest, and they're like, we need to get rid of prisons. We need to go talk to the community and or and then like privately, they're just like the next phase after Tiffany Caban is to accelerate our power position. My God. I told you that in confidence. <laughs> we need a mix of Machiavelli and Sun Tzu if we're going to get out of this pickle. <laughs> the only way to keep the race forward with Julia Salazar is to read from the Book of Rings, the Samurai Manual of Warfare. I'm not saying shit. AOC, Salazar, and Combine are uh, the deciding factor, I think, ultimately in all those races are these canvassing operations. So huge implications. And it's what's amazing about that type of grassroots effort is that's the the logistics and maybe some of the like style is different. But at the end of the day, there's not a massive difference in a broad principle of like going somewhere in the middle of no like I've canvassed in places where you're literally on dirt roads and you walk there might even be like a quarter mile between houses and also like in multi-story buildings. And the bottom line is, is you knock on somebody's door and you tell them about the stakes, their stakes in the election and what they care about, what they're interested in and why, you know, hopefully who you're repping is going to deliver for them. And that's amazing for all of the complexities of campaigns and all of the other things that you have to do that that is such a huge deciding factor. And you can't do that without uh, movements and organizations and candidates that actually represent something like Tiffany Caban. Yep. So that's a huge, uh, huge signal. And it's also a signal for people like some now more and more people have been calling in and saying like they're doing things like running for their city council or whatever. Do that. Mm -hmm. Do that. Get involved in your local whatever. You know, whatever you're drawn to, DSA, Justice Democrats. Even if you think that the uh, Democrats party. are going to work against you in some sort of Kabbalistic fashion, at least you make them do it, right? Like, and that, then, and that, sometimes that goes yeah. at their resources. And by the way, sometimes I mean, look, you might uh, the Queen's Democratic machine yeah. is a pretty. I mean, you know, we laugh now at people like Joe Crowley, but until he right. lost to AOC, that's a that's a person who ran a machine in Queens and was a top Democrat nationally in the House who had the sort of machine Democratic stuff, which is, you know, depreciating because of changes in capital and so on, but also had a funnel from Wall Street and real estate. This dude, OK, you could say he was upset in a one off. This is a personal rebuke to him. So the thing, you know, among many other more important things. But so that's the other thing is you. Yeah, sure. They'll work against you. Yeah. Oh, they you definitely be, will. There's no doubt. But it also could be a situation where you get a couple hundred people even could be enough to completely knock them off course. I mean, in, in, in amazingly enough, in a place like Queens in New York City, which is obviously a massive city, you're literally talking about like 10,000 people. 11,000 people. I mean, it's not that many to take on and, and, and see, you know, that there's a lot of glass jaws out there that haven't been properly challenged. Mm -hmm. And the machine is still quite powerful. Like, I don't want to say that it's not, um, the four major unions in New York city endorsed her opponent cats because, you know, they're making a gamble. They don't want to go up against the machine. They know that if the socialist somehow wins, they're not going to punish them. But if, uh, if they don't support the machine candidate and they win, they're absolutely going to punish them. But I hope between this and uh, AOC, I hope some unions take a second look and not necessarily for ideological reasons, although I want everyone to have a socialist ideology, but even just for pure reasons of power and self-interest, realize that it is in their self-interest to endorse candidates like Caban. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And yeah, they won't be punished. And the structure of the policies Caban supports will obviously be way better for people who work. And so therefore unions. But, you know, you're you're not going to be in the room in the same way. Yeah. Uh, and start thinking, you know, and again, I, I sympathize why unions are thinking of like what small turf they can protect because they've been under assault for decades. At the same time, if you want to survive, and you want to win the coming battles for survival, 
you actually need to think in broader terms in terms of what you actually can win and actually deliver for it. And that's Absolutely. represented by and, candidates like Kaban. And one more thing, because <clears throat> I know we've had some conversations here. We've had conversations in DSA about how we are prison abolitionists. We don't just want decarceration. We don't just want to reform the system, right? We want to change it and replace it with a new one and a better one. So for that reason, some people were hesitant to support a DA because they are part of the carceral state, regardless of what they're going to do once they're inside of it. But I really think, like, I have to believe that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can support this DA because this is the tool that's available to us right now to improve people's material conditions in a very real way and not turn our back on our fellow New Yorkers and ourselves while at the same time looking to a much more radical abolitionist horizon. Definitely. Today's sponsor is Skillshare. And anyone who goes to skl.sh slash majority report four is going to get two whole months of totally free access to Skillshare's entire library of super quality online courses and tutorials. Skillshare is a vibrant online learning community that offers courses in everything from design to video editing, photography, business, technology, cooking, meditation, and everything in between. There are Skillshare courses for everyone. You'll have no problem finding courses that will be useful to you in both your personal and professional life. Whether you want to sharpen your skills with something you already love doing or you want to learn to do something totally new, Skillshare has you covered. They have courses for entrepreneurs, courses on computer coding, web development, personal nutrition, learning new languages, Photoshop, you name it. I've been starting to check out the Portuguese course and I wish I was a more talented language student but I'm finding it incredibly accessible and easy to use. So maybe that will help lead me in the right direction. Uh, and it certainly is the most usable interface for language learning I've ever attempted by far. You can get two entire months of free access to every single course offered by Skillshare by going to skl.sh slash majority report four. Just think of everything you'll have at your fingertips for two whole months. Again, that's skl.sh slash majority report four. And I've put a link underneath this video if you're watching on YouTube. We'll be right back with Murtaza Hussein.
Welcome back to the Majority Report. Michael Brooks here. Joining us now is Murtaza Hussein. He's a writer and reporter for The Intercept. Murtaza, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Um, Murtaza, obviously, things, I mean, things have been escalating with Iran ever since Donald Trump took office and, you know, this very hard right approach uh, in terms of tearing up the deal, stepping out of our international obligations. At the same time, there's obviously some hesitation inside Donald Trump and within some kind of sectors of the far right around him, obviously. I mean, there's a lot of reporting that Tucker Carlson has actually been, you know, pretty strongly lobbying against this. And it does seem to me that there's some parts of this authoritarian right wing base that is that's war wary. I think that that's an actual thing. What's your and then of course, but you got Pompeo and Bolton and the usual, you know, hard right establishment pushing forward on this disastrous course. What's your sort of read on where we're at from the U.S. side? So Tucker Carlson, I think, is a standard bearer. Always become a standard bearer for this Pat Buchanan style conservatism. Mm-hmm. So it's not progressive in any sense. Yep, but. It does endorse a sort of a withdrawal of the United States from entanglements in the world, whether they be wars or alliances or any substantive engagement. Essentially, they'd like to turn the United States from an empire into an ethnostate, yep. specifically a white ethnostate. And in advocating that position, there are certain tactical positions they take, which align with progressive ideas now and then. But I think that the overall ideology that he's referencing to, especially when he's getting advice from Tucker Carlson, is a very hard right ideology. And Definitely, yeah. It's a manifestation in domestic politics, if it ever reached the stage of ascendance, uh, would be bad. It would be bad for progressive causes. Without a doubt. Um, do you... But... <laughs> But inside that relative context, right? I mean, and then, you know, and because even just like practically as an example, like, you know, Ro Khanna teaming up with Matt Gatz, right? One of the most just, you yeah. know, extremist sort of out of his mind members of Congress. What do you think, though, that in this context, that that formation that people like Tucker Carlson represent along with, if there can be, I mean, we see obviously leadership from Sanders and leadership from Khanna. There needs to be a lot more just sort of grassroots left anti-intervention, anti-war organizing on this. What do you think is it going to take to kind of pull us back from actually doing this, you know, I guess, in this immediate context? Yeah, I absolutely think that in the context of stopping a war, which seems to be imminent, uh, a tactical alliance, very enthusiastic on this issue is called for, it's wanted, and it's uh, something which is certainly defensible. And I think that it's happened in the past, too. Like, you know, people I disagree with about everything, like Pat Buchanan, for instance, I find to be correct about issues like the Iraq War. Right. So, and he's not even just correct, he's a very eloquent uh, eloquent, eloquent opponent of uh, imperialist wars. Uh, Ron Paul was very similar. But can this be stopped that, uh, is what I'm saying. I mean, even beyond just the ethics of it. I mean, do you think that there's a way of stopping this? Stopping like a, sort a military of action on Iran. Oh, right. You know, I feel, I find that uh, the decision making in this administration is so unpredictable mm-hmm. and it's so haphazard. The administration does not speak with one voice. Forget the government speaking with one voice, which is rare and almost never happens. This, uh, well, which I mean, the political establishment, but the administration, different individuals say radically different things on different days. The president himself says radically different things on different days. I find a, the prospect of a war to still be unlikely, although he, President Trump, and his administration are really pulling the United States much closer than it's ever been before. I think that he knows that it will be a disaster and he does not want a war. But I also think that his advisors are trying to box him into a situation where a war becomes inevitable, whether he wants it or not. 
the 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 Bolton Pompeo wing you're talking about. The Bolton Pompeo wing, and the thing that I think differentiates them and makes them more dangerous than Trump is that unlike Trump, they've been thinking about this for years and years. John Bolton is wanting to have a war with Iran. It's been one of the major themes of his career. Donald Trump does not have very deep knowledge or beliefs about things other than his own popularity and uh, getting reelected in 2020. And I think that when you're faced with people who are very knowledgeable in their own way and very committed to a certain ideological project, and you have someone like the president who it seems very malleable and does not have strong knowledge or strong beliefs, there's a great risk that they can succeed in maneuvering into some, him into something which he doesn't necessarily want. What about the Iranian side? I mean, obviously, the Iranians have, re- have reacted very sharply. Um, and it seems to me that at least in to one sense that you sort of can maybe glean from Trump because he does have no knowledge and understanding of any of these things, but that he doesn't get like the basic difference in terms of North Korea, that there was an innate goal in having the North Koreans have some type of direct meeting with an American president. That was a major mission. The Iranians don't share that mission. They don't need it. Uh, they're, you know, they actually have a lot of good relationships internationally and they have a very different foreign policy making process and, and, and sort of, uh, presence on the world stage. So inside Iran, like even as Rouhani and Zarif have had to shift after being the kind of like main proponents of diplomacy with the United States, and obviously Rouhani's used some very provocative language recently to talk about Trump, which is kind of funny. What is happening inside Iran? I mean, does this mean – is there like a right-wing tendency in Iran that you know wants to close off any relations with the United States? Is you know it, what What's happening there on that side of it from your sense? The engagement between the United States and Iran was very controversial inside of Iran for precisely the reason that you mentioned, that there are very powerful factions – in the Iranian government who are against any negotiations with the United States. So to engage in that two-year process of negotiating the nuclear deal required a tremendous amount of political capital on behalf of Rouhani and Zarif and you could say the civilian wing of the Iranian establishment. And they had to make the argument that the United States will negotiate in good faith against the counter-argument, which is that the United States cannot be trusted and they're our enemy. And if you look at what happened since Trump came to office with the sudden annulment of the nuclear deal and the escalation of threats and sanctions, even though the Iranians have held up their side, the right wing in Iran has been validated. And to say that we're going to negotiate now on some totally new terms, there's just no political capital for that. And the Iranians, in a sense, is different from North Korea because there is internal politics. There are internal politics in Iran. There are factions. There are, uh, you know, the visible factions. And no one wants to be humiliated. And no one wants to lose face. And uh, that's, for that reason, I think it's extremely unlikely that there will be any negotiations unless the first step is that the Trump administration announces that it's returning to the nuclear deal. And it doesn't seem to me that Trump I don't even understands what's in the nuclear deal or particularly cares because he he keeps emphasizing that his requirement for Iran is that they not develop nuclear weapons. And the point of the nuclear deal was to ensure that doesn't happen and to impose very strict uh, surveillance on their nuclear energy program. So the idea that it doesn't surprise me at all that Zarif and these other people are taking a hard line towards Trump now because they don't have any choice. Right. There's no way they can engage with negotiations with him unless he starts from going back to the JCP early, and he's not going to do that. And I think for that reason, we're not going to see any movement in terms of diplomacy, at least as long as this president is in power. And if he, someone else is elected in 2020 and they want to go back to the JCPOA, I think that the Iranians probably could do that. The issue is they really, even if they lose faith, they need to go back to some sort of negotiation with the Americans at some point because economically, their current situation is not tenable. 
Right, but right. So that makes sense. I mean, the, the sanctions are hitting them really hard. People aren't getting vital things like even cancer medications. But like what I mean, all Democrats and I think there's obviously varying levels of actual commitment to this and there's still a lot of kind of closeness among a lot of Democratic candidates to APAC and other, you know, right-wing lobbies. But what if a Democrat wouldn't it take more though? Like wouldn't a next president have to say not only are we going to restore this deal, but we actually have to make up for the complete sort of elimination of our credibility and your ability to trust us. Like, what are the safeguards that need to be put in place? I think it's a very good question. I think that even if the next administration comes back and says that we will make a deal with you, and oh, sorry, we will return to our deal with you, what will happen with the next administration? All right. There's always this question. I think that this irreparable damage has been done to the United States' ability to do diplomacy by the behavior of this administration and its supporters, a very extremist behavior, because they've basically annihilated American credibility, or they have given the very strong impression that the U.S. is institutionally incapable of doing diplomacy, complex, sensitive diplomacy, such as the JCPOA. Because of their political system, they can't manage their side of the deal. So the rational perspective from the Iranian perspective is to hedge your bets. And even if in four years of the next administration, you return to the deal and maybe some sanctions are lifted, you probably still move towards a nuclear weapon at some point. Every country in the world has gotten a very strong message that nuclear weapons are the only insurance. And you can ask Kim Jong-un or the Pakistani military, where Osama bin Laden was found in Pakistani territory, that it's a great insurance policy. You can ask Gaddafi or now potentially Iran what happens when you don't have a nuclear weapon. Saddam Hussein. And it's not to say that Saddam Hussein, it's not to say that nuclear weapons are good or we should see, want to see a world with nuclear proliferation, just that because of their decisions, because of their destruction of nuclear diplomacy in this case, the U.S. has made that the rational choice for a new regime that it's institutionally hostile towards. So let's talk about uh, this unbelievable piece that you reported uh, a couple of weeks ago. And Iran, because I think this actually is very important, both in terms of the propaganda uh, and the really extremist influences pushing war on Iran. But it's an Iranian activist wrote dozens of articles for right wing outlets. But was he a real person? What is this? Mataza, break this down for us. There was a very prominent, or I should say very loud, Iranian activist writer online, Heshmat Alavi, who is pushing for the most strenuous, most, uh, most strict policies from the United States towards Iran, calling for heavy sanctions on Iran, calling for war with Iran, obliquely, uh, and also attacking anyone who comments on Iran and trying to do character assassination against them if they don't fit with this person, Heshmat's uh, preferences for what should happen with U.S. policy towards Iran. Now, a few months ago, someone contacted me and told me that this individual doesn't exist. And not to say that they're not writing these articles for Forbes and the Daily Caller and the Federalist and several other right-leaning outlets and tweeting every day dozens of times but that they are a, actually a team of people, three to five people with a commander in a unit of an organization called the MEK, which is an Iranian opposition group, which probably has the distinction of being the one group that's uh, the Iranian regime and its other progressive opponents equally agree are horrible and uh are not a progressive alternative for Iran. Why does everybody uh, hate the MEK? The... Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yes. So the MEK has its roots in the Iranian Revolution, but it was one of the factions which was defeated by the Ayatollahs who took power. Later on, they developed a cult-like personality, a cult of personality around the certain leaders who still lead the organization. 
But most controversially, perhaps, they sided with Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq war, which was a very traumatic period in Iranian history, just because they were so focused on coming to power in Iran and Iraq. They're a very authoritarian group, and very shadowy, and they have ties to Saudis and John Bolton and many, many other people. Um, so essentially, the MEK was behind this account, and they operate out of a base in Albania. It's very interesting. They have huge bills in Albania, presumably, and in D.C. where they do lobbying in France. But they have this huge operation with hundreds of computers uh, focused on spreading their message, commenting on every post related to Iran and social media, and also trying to get articles planted by Iranian activists, quote-unquote. And Hashmat Alavi was a project, or is a project, of this organization and its online operations wing. And they succeeded in getting articles published in American publications. And they also, these articles are being read in the White House because the White House was citing Heshmet's articles to justify its own decision to exit from the nuclear deal. What, um, do we have any idea of how the MEK is funded or how they get their money? I mean, they've also, I mean, they've paid John Bolton, they've paid Howard Dean, they've paid a bunch of other prominent people. Rudy Giuliani, I believe, has taken money from them. Where do they get their mm-hmm. funding from? Well, as you said, they have a lot of money. It's, it's very strange because they should be, you know, on Kickstarter mode. Uh, that's the level of popularity they have and the Iranian diaspora and in Iran. That's, there's a lot of speculation. So there's speculation that they have friends in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, speculation that neoconservatives or neoconservative institutions support them. And it's also known from defectors from the organization, which by some estimates has 15,000 members, that people who are part of the organization are effectively forced to give all their income or all their assets to the organization's leaders. So if maybe if you are in the MEK, they'll ask you to take a mortgage or take a second mortgage and give them the money for that. And your own credit doesn't matter because you're part of the organization. It's sort of cult-like behavior. You know, it's it's one of the big questions which remains about them. I would say probably the answer is all of the above or when you think about how they get funds. So you have a, a fake bot account which got published in Forbes, Federalist. It turns out it's not a real person. It's an online operation run by an extremist cult political project that has connections with, I think, also Israeli intelligence the Gulf, neoconservatives, they are loathed across the board in Iran. And this fake, literal fake news was partially laundered in the Trump administration's public justifications for generating the current crisis we're in with Iran. That's right. And uh, I think that there are probably more accounts like this and more fake people and fake authors out there doesn't, it doesn't mean that there are no real Iranian opposition activists or dissidents by any means. It just means that people have been taking advantage of this epistemological crisis, which has been generated by the Internet, to manipulate public discourse. And the most troubling thing is, is not that, I mean, one of the many troubling things is that it was also engaging in very vicious harassment and character assassination against people who really are Iranian dissidents or critics of the government or supporters of diplomacy rather than war who are in the Iranian diaspora. This account, then this person is making life hell for them. And what that does is it makes a real, a genuine conversation about U.S. policy towards Iran more difficult. Uh, It makes it hard to, you know, find a nuanced policy that accounts for human rights in Iran, but also does not lead to a war or immiserate people there through sanctions and also deals in the areas where the U.S. does have legitimate uh, competition with Iran. You know, we can't have a nuanced discussion because people are flooding the discourse on the subject with all sorts of misinformation, hysteria, and propaganda. This is just the most uh, vulgar example of that. Uh, you know, it happens in all, all sectors. Let's uh, take a few minutes to talk about this Kushner plan that he just unveiled in Bahrain. Uh, 
It was boycotted by the Palestinians. I mean, basically, this is the big thing that we've been hearing from the beginning of the Trump administration, that on top of all of the oppression and insults of the Palestinians for so long, that now on top of everything else, you know, Donald Trump has sort of put this this ridiculous trust fund baby figure in charge of solving um well we always say it's an intractable conflict i mean the truth is is how to solve it is actually fairly simple but there isn't the because of the asymmetry of power and the dynamics it hasn't been solved and nobody's willing to put pressure on israel least of all obviously the trump administration but let's just play this clip of kushner outlining it and then i'll throw to you murtaza i mean this is if the implications weren't so bad for the Palestinian people, there is, I mean, this is a real, this is very, like, this is a very Ian uh, thick of it sort of vice thing. Like, we we'll, let's, let's put like the idiot kid who married the daughter of the president in charge of the most major area of failed diplomacy for decades. Here he is. Numerous well-intended programs, investments, and plans have been derailed by violence, political instability, and the lack of a resolution to the long-standing core issues of this conflict. To be clear, economic growth and prosperity for the Palestinian people are not possible without an enduring and fair political solution to the conflict, one that guarantees Israel's security and respects the dignity of the Palestinian people. However, today is not about the political issues. We'll get to those at the right time. The goal of this workshop is to begin thinking about these challenges in a new way. Let's try to view this conflict and the potential of the entire region through a different lens and work together to develop a concrete plan to try and achieve it. For a moment, imagine a new reality in the Middle East. <laughs> imagine a bustling commercial and tourist center in Gaza and the West Bank where international businesses come together and thrive. Imagine the West Bank as a blossoming economy full of entrepreneurs, engineers, scientists, and business leaders. Imagine people and goods flowing quickly and securely throughout the region as economics become more integrated and people become more prosperous. This isn't a stretch. This is actually the historical legacy of the Middle East, specifically of Gaza and the West Bank. It is a legacy of great cultures coming together as a center of commerce, innovation, and prosperity. I just want to add, I mean, this was at the Peace and Prosperity Workshop hosted, uh, which was in, hosted in, in Bahrain in Manam, in, uh, Manamua, which I'm totally butchering for some reason. And as Christine Lagarde, who is, of course, the managing director of the IMF, she said that the peace was missing from the economic workshop. I mean, Murtaza, what are your thoughts on this farce? Yeah, so essentially... Uh, they're trying to, or Kushner is trying to substitute an economic solution for a political solution. Although in his speech, in his remarks there, he did say something about political solution, but he didn't say anything about what it would be. That's the main problem here. You know, he once uh, bragged about the fact that he doesn't read books about the subject, or he dismissed the ideas of reading books about the subject. And I think it really shows in his analysis or his proposal because they're totally divorced from reality. And they also don't make any sense because he's been spending a year or longer, him and other Trump administration officials, just heaping insults on the Palestinians or putting pressure on them, uh, taking away, taking subjects like Jerusalem off the table completely. And now you're having this conference, which, you know, presumably you should have built all this trust with them by this point. It doesn't make any sense. It's just, uh, it's a completely ham handed attempt at, uh, I don't even think it's an attempt at diplomacy. It just seems like trolling. Right. Um, he, he just, uh, his analysis is like, I think the average person could probably do a better job at trying to solve this issue. Someone who doesn't have any understanding of the issue at all. I think that, uh, he's worse than that at uh, trying to resolve the issue. And I, I would give him a chance if I thought that uh, he had a real idea. He just doesn't seem to have any idea. The PLO, of course, rejected it. Um, but just, I just one other thing I want to touch on before you go, though, is this is a real testament to this incredible linkage between the Trump administration and MBS and Saudi Arabia, because the Saudis, who 
you know, I don't, you know, I don't think obviously there's not, there's never been a sort of sincere concern for Palestinian uh, rights or interests. But even going back to the old Saudi initiative of over of like the Bush era, which basically would have been an actual two state solution in exchange for a broader Middle Eastern recognition of Israel. Uh, that still meant at least some actual autonomy and political gains for the Palestinians. In this case, the Saudi minister on the ground who was at the workshop said that they think that the plan could succeed. I truly believe it can be done. And the pe- and if the people do believe, then it can be done, said Mohammed al-Sheikh at the workshop. And the way to make people on the ground believe it is to give them hope and this will be that this will be sustainable and that this will be everlasting and that the ultimately there will be prosperity and there will be sustained development and the sort of motivational globalization right. speak. But I mean, what do you make of that level um, between Saudi and, and the Trump administration uh, and maybe even potentially, I mean, obviously you know, the back door between Saudi Arabia and, and right wing forces in Israel. I actually think that the 2002 initiative, which is, reiterated in subsequent years it was actually a pretty good plan for ending the conflict right. and I think it's very disappointing that Israeli leaders didn't respond to it because it on paper it seems to give everybody an acceptable outcome it gives right. recognition to Israel and political economic integration with the rest of the region which I think is a good thing if, uh, in the context of a peace deal it gives the Palestinians uh, independence and uh, a share of Jerusalem and so forth. Unfortunately, so much has changed since 2002 and mostly for the negative. The region has just completely gone into chaos. And now the Gulf states, their concern is with Iran and with staying in power economically, uh, managing the economic staying in power in terms of managing their own population. They are not interested in the Palestinians anymore. They have bigger fish to fry in their own in their own perspective, and they would like to work with the Israelis more openly well, on the issues that they have shared interests. There's probably some resentment towards the Palestinians now, which is dismissal of them. So the 2002 deal was a non-starter for Israel in 2002. So there's no indication that they're going to change their mind now. There's right. no reason for them to. Of course. And, you know, now, given that reality, the Saudis still want to work with them, so let's try to push through the deal of the century, the Kushner plan. The thing is, the one thing the Palestinians will say, and the Palestinian national movement has made many mistakes over the decades, not the flawless. But one mistake that I think they'll never make is that they're not going to surrender. They will always continue suffering, regardless of how much pressure is put on them, until they achieve their goal, which is self-determination. Right. So this whole idea that Kushner and MBS have of putting a gun to their head and hoping they just surrender and accept uh, a payment in lieu of statehood, it's never going to happen. And it shows that they don't read any books because anyone can tell you that. <laughs> Murtaza Hussein, reporter for The Intercept. I really appreciate your time as always, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care. All right, folks. We are going to get to the fun half. Uh, open up IMs and lines and and blah, blah, blah. There was a, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but last night on TMBS, uh, when we have music breaks, we have these great interstitials from DJ Danarchy, and Matt plays a lot of drops over them from the sort of world of, you know, of, of idiots like Ruben. And you played Dave Rubin's like, I really think the left hates gamers. <laughs> and you timed it. I Someone pointed this out. It was so funny because you you timed it where one piece of music was ending. And so then you had actually, there was like probably like three seconds of silence and then the next track came on and he's just still going like they want, whether it's an RPG or a game, they, they want to solve problems. <laughs> I don't know if I'm doing you have justice. To accomplish something in a video game. You have to keep trying to succeed. Yes. Can you go to game facts or can you, <laughs> get the cheat code and all that stuff you do it really is about you figuring out how to do all this stuff and that to me sort of shows why the media and especially the leftist media hates games now or hates gamers 
They don't like people who solve like, problems. His guess am I, is, am like, I, is this a bridge too far or am I onto something? I don't know. I haven't really thought. I have to think about it. I haven't really thought about it. <laughs> I think there's something there. Gamers want to get shit done. Whatever world you're in, whether you're playing a sports game or an this adventure one of his game idea or an RPG Coke or whatever, oh, you're man, trying to, you're building something, you're level, accomplishing level. something. You may have to have teammates and all do it. You don't want people to help you do everything and cheat for you. That's you got to play to your base. <laughs> oh, man, he's so dumb. It really explains a lot when you think about it. It does. I mean, I, it's definitely not something like, I had thought about. When I was playing Red Dead Redemption 2 and learning how to be a cowboy, learning right. how to do all these things, like, right, you're like uh, saddle horses and, you know, um, break them in and, you know. Uh, you didn't want somebody else to do that for you. Yeah. and You, you didn't want to tra- cheat track big game um i'm like i'm like i am i'm turning my back on my life as a leftist when i'm doing this that's always been my big concern with you when you say that you like to load up a bong and play like five hours of video games i'm just you know i've always i'm like matt jesus is there a problem technically guys all right okay fixed it let's go to uh the fun half, become a member of the Majority Report today. Majority.fm slash become a member. That's how the show happens. That's how you get everything from Iran war prevention, hopefully, to Ruben Duncan. To IDW harassment. <laughs> get words. Bullying. Um, I accept Hashtag it. bully the right people. There's a difference between form and content. Indeed. Uh yeah, yesterday on TMBS, we had an excellent show. Brian Mayer, we went deep, of course, which we'll talk about in the, in the second half of this new immense injustice. I mean, Lula still being imprisoned, even after the revelations of the incredible corruption of the Lava Jato team. We talked about that, but also the broader geostrategic context, linking it with the NSA spying on Petrobras U.S. reversal of the pink tide. Then Harvey K. came in. We talked about the history of A. Philip Randolph, why the march on Washington was about jobs and justice, and the strategic necessity of Sanders to claim the FDR legacy, and the commentary on the state of play, state of crisis, but state of potential opportunity in Iran, in uh, Saudi, in excuse me, in the Sudan, and how Omar al Bashir, who used to be an international villain. And the Janjaweed militia that committed crimes against humanity in Darfur became partners with European member states in keeping migrants from crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, this weekend strategy session with uh, labor organizer, strategist, author Bill Fletcher Jr. on the progressive movement and the Democratic Party and how to actually build socialism. Patreon.com slash TMBS, Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. And please, you do not want to miss, so click there. It's right on the site. Get your tickets to the August 24th Michael Brooks live show in Chicago, Illinois. Jamie. This week on the Antifada, we speak with the prolific poster known as Chad Vigorous, a.k.a. Pretty Bad Lefty on Twitter.com. Such a smart guy. Such a good talker. Uh, We had a wide-ranging conversation, including uh, we talked about his ethnographic studies of white music. Um, We we asked which white artists speak to him the most and why. Um, Can we give get some examples? Willie Nelson. He likes like gutter post grudge. Oh, you that makes total like sense. Creed and Hoobastank, and like anything oh, where people are yelling at you because he likes to lift to it. He he does like Nine Inch Nails, so we can bond over that. Wow. Um. Yeah. And we talk about the infuriating and depressing debate over what is or isn't a concentration camp, as well as liberalism's tendency toward rhetorical chicanery rather than actually addressing the issues surrounding race and class in U.S. society. So check it out. It's out now. Awesome. Matt. A literary hangover. We talk about Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Blythedale Romance. And among other things, we talk about why the utopian socialists didn't really work out because basically it was this thing where you would have to have enough money because you had to be bourgeois in the first place to buy property somewhere. And then you start a commune and try to lead by lead a revolution by example of how you like organize your day, for instance. And it turns out that the uh, global market is a bit too tough. It's a very tough deal. See you in the fun half. 
left his best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. Do. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. Uh, 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 ooh. Wow. Uh, uh, um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly.